Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In chapters 2 and 6 of Tragic Sense of Life, Miguel de Unamuno is going to set out for us an existentialist problematic that he thinks is largely inescapable and unavoidable for us, however much we might like to deny it. Now, he does think that there is an important proviso that has to be made here. When we are directly engaged in just trying to stay alive, trying to per maintain our existence, to perpetuate ourselves, we, we often don't think of these things because we're concerned with other objects, you know. So if we're in illness, uh, perhaps, and just struggling to, to main our, maintain ourselves, then this won't be that much of an issue. Although these thoughts do arise for people on their sick beds. If we are trying to, you know, avoid being killed, uh, famine, these sorts of other issues, uh, if we're stuck working endlessly just to make enough bread to stay alive for the next day, these may not arise. But for everybody else, he thinks either these, these issues have arisen for you or you're hiding from them and they have on some level arisen for you and you've made a decision, you just haven't announced that to yourself and to others. So he begins by saying that human beings, this is something that's, that's essential to us, are, are questioning creatures. We want to know, as he says, the whys of things, the cause. And we also want to know the wherefore, the end. And we want to know this about our own existence, our own lives. So we want to know why, what brought us into being, what is the purpose of our lives. But we also want to know where are we going to end up. And he tells us, um, here we go, whence do I come, whence comes the world in which, uh, which and by which I live, whither do I go and whither goes everything that environs me. What does it all mean? Such are the questions that a human being asks once they free themselves from the brutalizing necessity of laboring for material sustenance. And he says, if we look closely, we will see that beneath these questions lies the wish not to know, not to know so much the why as the wherefore. Not the cause, but the end. The meaning of the why lies in part in the wherefore. You can say, well, you know, we were created by the gods to serve them so they wouldn't have to serve each other as in the Babylonian Enuma Elish. And if being told that doesn't really supply much of an answer unless we actually know, okay, so what's happening to us then? What, what is the status of these things that we are? When we die, do we just simply vanish back into the primordial crap that we came from? Or the, you know, we're resolved into the elements and you know, there's little bits of stardust inside of us and we'll, we'll all become stars eventually. Or, or do we have a personal immortality of some sort? Do we live on through others and legacy within this life? All of these sorts of questions are very important for, for people. And so we want to know where we are going and we also want to know where's this whole world and humanity going? Because I could have, you know, uh, immortality of, in a way, but if the whole world is gone and it's just me, is that a very good immortality? Or, you know, maybe we're going to have immortality, but it's like some of these religious conceptions where there's, you know, not just hell, but all these multiple levels of hell and we'll be in there either permanently or until somebody prays us out or until we've, you know, expiated our, our karmic debt or something like that, right? There's it, a lot of people are like, oh, I think there's a better place. That's such a uh, vague 
vague, you know, uh, airy fairy kind of stuff that nobody can really take much consolation in that for, for very long, right? You would want to know where we're actually going. It's a better place. What kind of better place? What kind of better existence? And so, you know, if you look at the culture and history of humanity, it's, it's replete with description after description after description of things that might be the case. This is even plays a role in philosophy. Think about Plato's apology. Socrates consoles his, uh, you know, the people surrounding him, his supporters and interlocutors by saying, well, they're going to condemn me to death, but not that big of a deal. You know, either death is a big sleep and he gives a totally implausible argument for that. Or I'm going to go down to Hades and then I'm going to harangue all the dead down there and find out who's really a hero and who's not. And they won't be able to get away from me by shutting me up and killing me the way they did up here. Well, you know, this plays a central role in philosophy. We are interested in these questions. Um, so there's a problematic that's being laid out, uh, according to Unamuno. And he says that there's three fundamental solutions to it. So this is early on in the book. This is in chapter two, the starting point. Towards the end of the chapter, he says, why do I wish to know whence I come and whither I go, whence comes and whither goes everything that environs me and what is the meaning of it all? He says, for I, wish not, I do not wish to die utterly and I wish to know whether I am to die or not definitely. If I do not die, what is my destiny? If I die, then nothing has any meaning for me. And so he says, there's three solutions. I know that I shall die utterly and then irre irremediable despair. So we should pause on that for, for a moment. Irremediable means nothing can actually fix this. You know, you can try to remove your despair for a while by watching cool stuff on, on you know, Netflix or Hulu or by shooting up, you know, or, or smoking something that'll make you feel better for a while or drinking a lot uh, or losing yourself in, you know, not just having lots of sex, but, but maybe passionate affairs that have all the spice of life. But lurking in the background is going to be this, you're going to die. And that's all there, there is. And this is all you get. And there's a kind of, you know, as a person ages, a kind of patheticness to trying to escape this. And so irremediable, unavoidable despair. And when we talk about despair, this is a word that a lot of people don't want to hear. Despair is the opposite of hope. It's saying there is no hope. There, there's nothing to, to shoot for. And this is something that some existentialists would say we should actually embrace. Unamuno is not saying we should embrace this, but he's saying if you know, like, you know, if you think that you're absolutely convinced that you're going to die, then this is it. Despair is the natural conclusion of that. What if you take the opposite? I know I shall not die utterly, meaning that I, I'm absolutely certain I will not die. And then he says something quite interesting here. Resignation. Resignation about this, this existence that we're in. In a certain sense, having absolute certainty of your immortality, of the fact that not just a little bit of you, but you will somehow go on Take something out of life. Take something out of the living that you're engaged in. By the way, this is not something, of course, he talks about, but we have all sorts of interesting science fiction and fantasy and, you know, novels and uh, television shows. Also, horror explores this as well. What would it be like to live forever? Would it be awesome because, oh, wow, you, you don't have to worry about dying? Or would it suck? Because everybody that you know dies and, you know, everything passes on. And after a while, it's all as equally unimportant and boring as anything else. The way that some people picture heaven sounds like a terrible place to go. I mean, the caricature of like everything's clouds and angels, you know, with halos and harps and white robes. That sounds like the most boring possible existence. Some people would say, man, I'll take hell instead of that. Um, although hell is going to be, you know, pretty, pretty bad as well. Um, if you, if, you know, if you have a better conception of the afterlife, uh, as, as many religious people do, one that's much more robust, well, then it could be quite interesting. But the, the keynote for this life would be resignation. Then he says something really interesting. And this is, this is the position that Unamuno himself is going to take. I cannot know either one or the other. 
And then we have conflict. What does that conflict look like? He says, resignation in despair or despair in resignation, a desperate resignation or a resigned despair and hence conflict. And he'll talk about this throughout the book, a conflict between uh, reason and feeling, a conflict between reason and life. This is what the tragic sense of life consists in and looks like. And the very title of the, the work, the whole subject matter of the work, is sort of encapsulated in this moment. And, and we could go back and forth. We could say, well, I'm doubtful now. I don't really know, but eventually I realize, no, this is it. I'm going to die. There's nothing left after this, or there is going to be immortality. Or we could start out with one of these because, you know, we were brought up with a certain catechism and it could be, uh, you know, a, a religious catechism. It could be an atheist secularist catechism. Uh, we learn from our parents that, you know, this is the way things are. And then we find out that our parents actually don't know that much compared to anybody else. Uh, and that there's been you know, sort of an open discussion about this going on pretty much in every culture that developed past a certain point for ages and ages and ages. And then we might fall into the conflict category, right? Now, in, um, in chapter six, in the depths of the abyss, Unamuno is going to expand this in two important ways and tell us some interesting things. Here he says something that might not be followed by everybody, and there could be some objections raised. He says, the absolute and complete certainty on the one hand that death is a complete, definite, irrevocable annihilation of personal consciousness, a certainty of the same order as the certainty that three angles of a triangle are equal to two right angles. So that would be the, the negation, right? Or um, the... The, on the other hand, the absolute and complete certainty our personal consciousness is prolonged beyond death in these present or in other conditions, and above all, including in itself that strange and adventitious addition of eternal rewards and punishments. So that'd be the second one. He says, both of these certainties alike would make life impossible for us. Now, isn't that a strange thing to say? Because don't we see a lot of people who have these absolute certainties and express them? Well, we do see people express them. We don't actually peer inside their heads or their souls or their hearts and see that that corresponds to what they indeed do think and feel. There's a lot of people who will talk about, you know, oh, we're, again, we're going to a better place, you know, and you press them on that and you say, well, how, how do you know that? What is your basis for absolute certainty? Usually it amounts to like, well, I just have a feeling. Well, okay, then you might have some doubts about it. That's not absolute knowledge. Or they say, well, that helps me uh, get through the day. Oh, really? You have a purely pragmatic attitude about that? That's very interesting. That's not the same thing as knowledge, now is it? And once you actually start uncovering the fact that they don't have knowledge, they often get quite nervous on the spot. Why? Because they're actually in this third category. They don't really know. And they are caught within conflict and doubt. Unamuno thinks that within each of us, in the heart of hearts, you might say, we were not really sure. We, we can't say, I know I will die, die utterly because that's as dogmatic a position as any religious position. He's actually got something really interesting to say here about, you could call them anti-religious crusaders, um, he says, note the greater part of our atheists, and you will see they are atheists from a kind of rage, rage at not being able to believe there is a God. They are the personal enemies of God. They have invested nothingness with substance and personality, and their no God is an anti-God, right? Uh, and, you know, uh, whether this is a fair characterization, you certainly can uh, think of many people who are atheists of this stripe. You know, think about the old joke about, you know, an atheist, a CrossFitter, and a vegan walk into a bar. How do you know? Because they announce it to everybody when, when they're coming in. That's that kind of atheist, the person who is as committed as a religious believer to a position of knowledge that they don't really have and is based less on rationality. The rationality is kind of window dressing, and it's much more based on will and feeling. And we can say this about so many religious believers as well. So Unamuno thinks that we uh, all have doubts on some level. And the question is, do we want to be honest about those doubts? 
or not? Do we want to explore them or do we want to try to close ourselves off in one or the other of these? A little bit later, he tells us, this is in chapter 6 again, that all of these things involve despair. Our affirmation is despair. Our negation is despair. And from despair, we abstain from affirming and denying. Well, that's interesting. Our affirmation, our negation, and our abstaining from, from affirming or denying. Is the abstaining from affirming or denying, is that actually this I cannot know one or the other, what, what Unamuno and other places will call passionate doubt? I don't think so. I think this is actually, you could say, a sort of truncated way of dealing with this, of not really addressing the conflict. You abstain in a sort of Cartesian, I don't know whether things are true or false. That's a position of neutrality. Neutrality is not the same thing as inner conflict between these, these warring or competing or contradictory ideas and the attempt to work them out. It's rather another position of saying, ah, I'm going to just put this off to the side and not think about it. Perfectly compatible, by the way, with you know a hedonistic or consumeristic or whatever escapist lifestyle you're going to pursue or losing yourself in radical politics on the left or right or doing all sorts of other things. Becoming you know, somebody who's obsessed with a certain kind of fandom it, it would be a way of avoiding this for Unamuno. If we're going to be authentic thinkers and livers and feelers and willers, real people, as he likes to call it, people of you know, flesh and bone, we're not going to be able to avoid this and we're not going to be able to lose ourselves just in abstaining from taking a position. The position that we're going to take is going to be a messy, muddy, complicated one that we're going to have to continually work through uh, and we can't avoid these sorts of matters entirely except by as he pointed out earlier um, being stuck within an endless cycle of having to just sustain ourselves once we get past that once we've uh, got a little bit of leisure or freedom these issues are going to arise for us as part of our existential condition 